welcome to BSF. My name is Vicki and we are going to study Revelation 1 tonight. So let's pray and get started. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you how you care for us. You pursue us and you love us. Thank you for opening our eyes to you. And we pray, Lord, that you would do this as we turn to your word, that the words that we read tonight in Revelation 1 would be those that uh, show us who you are, Father, and who your Son, the Lord Jesus, is. Uh, give us ears to hear and soft hearts that we can respond. And we pray that our listening and studying your word would bring glory to Jesus, uh, not only right now in our hearts, how we respond to you in worship, but also that our lives would be changed and we would give Jesus glory. We pray this in his name. Amen. So last weekend, my cousin and I were driving to a dinner with uh, my relatives. We were driving in my neighborhood. She was visiting from out of town. And I've driven on this road hundreds, if not thousands of times, and came up to a stop sign where a tiny neighborhood street turns onto a more major street. And I am looking, I turn my head left, and I'm looking, there were cars coming, surprising on a Sunday afternoon how many cars there were coming, but many cars coming. And then finally there's an opening. And uh, as I turn my head to the right, my foot goes down on the accelerator pedal. And I, my, as my head comes around, I see there is a boy who has... Uh, ridden out in with his bike right in front of me and I I gasp and I slammed on the brakes uh fortunately uh in time that the that my car didn't uh touch the child and this was on a sidewalk that pedestrians rarely rarely ever use but there he is and he rides away I don't think that he even looked at us or imagined how very different that afternoon could have turned out for the both of us. Uh, I drove away different, uh, differently. I was rattled and, uh, I, I'm, I was also thankful. Uh, and my, I think the first words out of my mouth were, thank you, Jesus. And I'm not only thankful that the Lord has, uh, that the Lord intervened in that moment. And, uh, that's how I understand what happened that allowed me to see and stop in time that this child in just an ordinary way that the child wouldn't be hurt, that I wouldn't, um, have that, uh, on my conscience and, uh, but also a thankfulness underlying it too, that the Lord has been training my heart to see ordinary things in light of who he is and his larger plan and what it looks like to live on gospel mission. Life gets so ordinary sometimes. And just like I'm driving down my my neighborhood little street, uh, we, you and I, can go on autopilot. And day after day, we go to the same grocery stores. We uh, walk the same sidewalks. We talk to the same people. There are lots of things that we focus on, and many of those are good. And yet we can get sleepy. Uh, in the sense that we're lulled into the ordinary rhythms of life and work and play and just kind of assume that the day is just going to go like any other day. And tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that will be uh, just the same as the, all the ones before. But then all of a sudden things happen and life isn't ordinary anymore. Uh, a flash flood, a doctor's phone call, a podcast, a chance uh, meeting, and these things jolt us and we look at our priorities with new eyes and de our decisions with new resolve. Uh, and the book of Revelation, I suggest to you, was written to do just that. Uh, Christians, early Christians, had faced many things in the several decades after Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, rose again, was on the earth for 40 more days, and then ascended into heaven, according to eyewitnesses. And uh, these Christians 
who had probably followers of Christ had given up uh, real and hard things to follow Jesus. And we can see that uh, they were probably faced as we can see, open up your Bibles to Revelation 1. In Revelation 1, they probably faced suffering um, and patient endurance. Uh, they needed patient endurance to endure, uh, to live in a world where following Jesus was not easy, even as we'll read later on next week, that the cost of some of them had to uh, give up their own lives that following Jesus would bring that level of persecution. And yet Jesus had promised that he would come back uh, in John chapter 14, for example. Um, but that was many years ago. And perhaps these uh, Christians, the original audience, were starting to get lulled in the ordinary rhythms. And uh, maybe they were wondering, has Jesus forgotten? Did we misunderstand? Thing like, Will this actually really happen? Uh, and life keeps going on ordinary, ordinarily. And maybe those who actually weren't, uh, you know, who were living faithfully day by day and looking with their eyes watchfully uh, living, uh, like, say, the Apostle John, the author of this letter, perhaps they were weary and discouraged. And so uh, Jesus intervenes. He's not surprised. And Revelation is a testament to how he pursues his followers. He crashes into our ordinary sleepy lives because it matters that we stay awake and we live on mission for him and persevere. So I think that's what we can learn tonight. One of the lessons as we study Revelation 1, that Jesus wants us to live prepared for his certain coming. Jesus wants us to live now prepared for his certain coming. And, uh, Revelation is part of that pursuit to give us a vision, a clear vision of who he is and what is truly important. And so we're jumping into Revelation 1 tonight, which introduces the whole book. There is so much to talk about here, friends. Uh, there's going to be a lot we can't cover in depth. So please read the notes. They're wonderful. And also be prepared to come back to this chapter over and over and over again. It introduces and sits over the whole book and gathers all the themes of Revelation in one place. So when you get lost in Revelation, come back here and get your bearings. And also just wanted to mention this too, uh, that we are reading, we are invited over here, I suggest to you, an internal conversation. Uh, much of what John is assuming that his audience, uh, the seven churches in the province of Asia, look at chapter one, verse four, and uh, that they are believers in Jesus, and they have already understood and believed in real in, in their heart, and it's lived out in their life that Jesus, they believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead, that he is the atonement for their sins, and that he has promised to return and to return for them. And so that, I understand, may not describe you it, uh, as you're listening. You may not identify with uh, as a believer in Jesus, or you may not understand or, or agree with, uh, doesn't cohere with maybe how you understand the world to work. And so uh, I, uh, in your awareness probably, and um, other people that we, you know, if you're a believer in Jesus, just know there are other people in our lives who don't believe in Jesus. This is not their understanding. They don't understand that, you know, dead people, when they're dead, they don't come back to life. And they certainly don't come back on clouds or with blazing features. And in a way, I suggest to you, friends, that is exactly the point. Uh, John is presenting Jesus as unique, that he is the only one who is doing this, who is uh, who is, has this character, and that he is an eyewitness. And so he was an eyewitness to Jesus's ministry through the three years, and he was an eyewitness at the cross. He was an eyewitness of his resurrection, the empty tomb, as we looked at the last several weeks, and eyewitness of him, the resurrected Jesus. And now we see that he is an eyewitness of Jesus as the exalted Jesus. And so we're going to go through tonight our, uh, our chapter, Revelation 1, in two sections, First eight verses, we'll see John introduces the letter's weightiness, one through eight. And then in verses nine through 20, John introduces the exalted Jesus. 
So let's get start uh, started verses one to eight. Open up your Bibles again if you don't have that uh, open yet. John communicates the unusual weightiness and focus of this letter. And uh, so we're going to look at this section in two parts, verses one to three and then four to eight. One to three really establishes what we should expect as we come to this book. And in 1a, we read, it begins the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is a Greek word, the Greek word that's used here, apocalypse, or that's the English word that we get from the Greek word apocalypse. Apocalypse uh, means uncovering or an unveiling. Something that has previously been hidden and has been a mystery is now revealed. And I mean that mystery in the uh, the theological biblical sense, not a whodunit, but like look at verse 19, Jesus himself speaks about the mystery of um, of the churches. And uh, so apocalypse was a first century genre. And it would um, just the this first word that's uh, it's actually the first one word in Greek is uh, apocalypse, apocalypsis. Then it would orient the readers for to expect end times things. What is John going to be talking about? He's going to be talking about end times things in ways that are dramatic and where there's imagery and much is still hidden. Uh, revelation of Jesus Christ, this phrase shows us revealing and concealing right away. Uh, what does that of mean? Is it an unveiling about Jesus Christ? Is he being unveiled or is the unveiling from Jesus? Uh, is he doing the unveiling? And uh, to decide this, of course, we need to draw closer to the text, but I suggest to you the answer is both. Uh, if we look at verse 1b, we can see it is, uh, it is from Jesus because the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, which what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So God gave it this revelation, this, uh, this material, this content this message to Jesus and Jesus gave it to his servants. Uh, so that does mean, yes, it is from him, but also it seems that it is about him. Uh, Jesus is the central figure of revelation. And we will see throughout chapter one tonight, every single word that is part of this chapter has its context with Jesus at the center. And uh, the Jesus, the anointed one, Christ, meaning uh, the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew word, meaning anointed, Messiah. And so we're going to see that uh, Jesus coming together with bringing the anointing roles from the Old Testament into one person, uh, priest, judge, prophet, and king. And Jesus gathers all that in his one perfect person perfectly. And so uh, this revelation, as we see, is related to what must soon take place. So there's God as a plan, but ultimately uh, what must take place will reveal Jesus' true character. So if we needed more reason to listen, we uh, John gives us that. Uh, again, this is from God. And so uh, the message has the stamp of authority it's coming from a trustworthy source. And then Jesus also gives us a, a, an, an encouragement to, to listen and to read and take to heart what is in here in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. And this is the first blessing of seven that John will give here in the book of Revelation. And blessing conveys the idea of human flourishing, life as God the Creator intended it. And that's often different, of course, from the what we as humans would think naturally is blessing. We think I'm blessed if things go smoothly in my life or my bank account is full or my boss likes me or if I have free time or I feel happy. Uh, but God created us and he alone what knows what true flourishing looks like. And we will see this blessing then on God's terms. It's spiritual blessing now with the promise of full blessing later. And I suggest to you the blessing is comes 
along with what John describes in verse 9. Um, there is blessing in a suffering because it's shared with Jesus. Uh, there is blessing in Jesus' kingdom to be a, a servant within his kingdom. And there's blessing in learning God's faithfulness in patient endurance. And so uh, these words and blessing are meant to be heard and believed now while we wait. And that is both encouragement for the weary heart. Jesus sees you. He knows you. He loves you. He's coming back for you. He wins. But it's also to warn the hard heartedness that uh, believers can have. Uh, Listen up. Jesus King, turn from the path that you're on and turn toward Jesus. It's not too late, but the time is near, which implicitly tells us that how we live now matters. It matters to Jesus. He cares about how we live, and we he wants us to be blessed, but knows that the pathway is challenging. Jesus knows what is coming, so we should listen to him. And what you believe about Jesus can be seen in how you respond to his word, Um, What you believe about Jesus determines how you will wait for his return. So verses four through eight, we can see this is an, uh, John goes on to take the common parts of a Greco-Roman first century letter, and he explodes them with weightiness uh, that is appropriate for this material. So he begins in verse four, Uh, saying where a a letter writer's name, uh, the author would come here first, John. And then uh, the next part in verse four is the audience, the readers to the seven churches in the province of Asia. So already we figure out again, it's an internal letter. It's to from a Christian to Christians. And it is a circular letter. It's not to just one person, but meant to be read aloud. And some scholars uh, suggest that the number seven, a number of completeness, invites an idea that this points to the whole church, that all the church, all believers in Jesus of every age are invited to listen. Certainly it's been preserved for us in his scriptures and we, it is preserved um, with intent for us to read and learn and be changed by. And so uh, as we go back, go on what would standardly be a, just a greeting, grace and peace or a a wish of good health. And you can look at some other New Testament letters to get an idea of that. Just flip back to John or first or second and third, uh, I'm sorry, Jude or second and third uh, John, just a few pages ahead of Revelation, if you're using a hard copy Bible, and you can see how extraordinary this Uh, this greeting is. John cannot hold it in. This is just an explosion. This is no ordinary letter and it is not about John and it's not about the churches. It's about Jesus, this extraordinary Jesus. And so he, he begins, of course, grace and peace to you in the middle of verse four. And there's sets of threes that he just keeps adding on to Uh, So the first one we have is from him who is and who was and who is to come. And so pointing the first, this first set of three stresses, God is eternal. And then from this one, the eternal one, uh, so grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and is to come. That's the first person. And from the seven spirits before his throne, second, and from Jesus Christ. So third. So again, we have this three seems to point, many scholars suggest, to the Trinity, God the Father on his throne, Jesus Christ the Son, and the seven spirits point to, many scholars feel, the Holy Spirit. Seven, again, is the number of completion, and uh, not seven different spirits, but a unified uh, breath and spirit of God, um, the the. Uh, the person, the persons of the triune God, the Trinity. And the third set of three, again, just John can't hold it in. Um, This is about who Jesus is in, in verse five, Uh, Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, uh, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the Kings of the earth. So these are all big weighty uh, ideas and terms. And then John can't hold it in anymore. He has to respond in praise. And so he uh, praises. uh, So reading five 
B and then going into uh, seven and eight. I'll just read it all together because it's all pointing. Feel how it's pointing up to our Lord and directing and shaping our hearts to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So, the, we have so much in here the, about who Jesus is. Again, the focus of it is what, who is he? He is the one who loves us. Notice the present tense. And it speaks about what he's done in the past to demonstrate that love. He has, uh, the greatest proof of his love is his self-sacrifice. He is the lamb who was, who was slain. He knew the price of our redemption, his own blood, and willingly paid it. And then he uh, he alludes to, or he says, you know, what, what is that, that, he, that, what has Jesus done by those things? He has made, uh, and he has made us to be a kingdom priest to serve his God and father. And so this, when Jesus saves us from sin, uh, he saves us for himself and for his father. This has always been God's plan for his covenant people. And the language here, kingdom, priests, uh, echoes the Old Testament language from Exodus 19 verses 4 through 6, when God had rescued the people of Israel out of, sla- the, uh, out of Pharaoh's land of slavery in Egypt and brought them to himself on the mountain, Mount Sinai. And he uh, invites them, draws them into a covenant with himself with this exact language. And so this has been uh, God's plan from the start. And so I think that this is, uh, well, we can just jump to a principle now. I'm looking at our time. Uh, What God has started, he will finish. What God has started, he will finish. And we can see uh, that God started this plan of having a people for himself that reflect his glory to the whole nation, to the whole world. This is happening even now uh, as believers are being transformed from their life of darkness to be claimed by Jesus and increasingly look like him, uh, reflect his character. So we can expect if Jesus saved you, he intends to cure you of self-centeredness. Has he done that for you? Um, if, if he has saved you and brought him to yourself, he, that what he has started, he will, he will finish, uh, that he will call us to be a channel of God's love and truth. Um, you and I can probably count projects that we've abandoned in our life for various reasons. We lost interest or it's too labor intensive or the window opportunity passes, or we just forget God is not like that at all. What he starts, he finishes. It's very hard for us to understand, but he always, always, always finishes. Not uh, as not slowly as we might think, but in the right time, according to his timetable. What God began in the Old Testament, he will finish. His great plan of redemption, saving a people for himself, his rule and reign, his kingdom of priests, he will judge the nations. And what Jesus, God, the son carried on in the New Testament, he will finish. There will be victory over sin and death. He will make all things new and God, the father will finish exalting his beloved son. God will finish all of these. God's work is more certain than the sun's rise tomorrow morning. And therefore this focal verse, uh, these two verses, seven and eight here at the end, eight expressing the eternality of God. He's not going to run out of time to accomplish his plans. Uh, But seven pulls, verse seven pulls back very specifically to the Old Testament, to Daniel chapter seven, and to draw forth this one who's coming with the clouds to judge the world before the ancient of days. And so just to pause 
I encourage us as we study Revelation, Revelation is full of symbols. And from now on, we're going to count a lot of them. Uh, the Old Testament is the key to understanding these symbols. Revelation overflows with the Old Testament. It's the it's almost the language that Revelation speaks, if that makes sense. Um, so when you encounter, when I encounter images and uh, ident persons and uh, actions that are happening in Revelation, I encourage us to think uh, not uh, like, for example, here, what do clouds mean to me? What do clouds mean in the world now? That's not the question we're invited to ask. Uh, what we're invited to do is draw closer to the God's word and think, where are there clouds in the scriptures? Where are the clouds in the Old Testament? One coming on the clouds. Who is that? And we're drawn to Daniel 7 in a vision given to uh, Daniel while God's people were in captivity. The son of man comes to rule and reign eternally. And John is saying, Jesus is this one. There's not another one that's coming. He is this one and he's coming in God's the Father's supreme authority and power. And the larger context of Daniel 7 is a courtroom. God is the supreme judge. Jesus will come as the judge. He will judge the nations and rule forever. His coming is fully endorsed by the God of Israel, the great I am, the all-powerful. Uh, what God has started, he will finish. How does this encourage you? How does this correct your priorities and values? What is important in your schedule in light of the reality that God is working his plans of redemption and what, where might there be things in your calendar or schedule that need to be let go for more gospel centered priorities? Jesus is surely coming back and he wants you and me to know how certain that is and to live watchful and prepared. Okay, let's go on to our next section uh, 9 through 20. John has the first of four visions in the book of Revelation, and he introduces as he encounters the exalted Jesus Christ. Uh, so this is basically in these first three verses, 9 through 11, John takes us back and tells us the story of how this letter happened. Uh, he takes us to the beginning. So I'm going to read these three verses together. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And then John will turn around. We'll come to that section next. So uh, this, again, is understood as John the Apostle. And uh, he's notice how he's identifying with his audience as the brother and companion of what are ours in Christ Jesus. And the Lord's Day uh, could be Sunday, the day of the Lord Jesus' resurrection, when it says he was in the Spirit. The, the text doesn't tell us exactly what that means, but the phrase we will find appears at the be near or at the beginning of the other three visions in the, the book. And I suggest to you that's significant. This is a key to say this is a start of a vision. Uh, it is a vision from God. And uh, the phrasing uh, conveys John's cooperation as his servant. Whatever the Lord had for him, he received was not of his own imagination. Uh, it's directly, he is writing this because this is what the Lord wants these churches to know and uh, how particular Jesus is about those, uh, this voice, which we will find out, I suggest to you in verses 17 and 18 are identified uh, as Jesus, uh, that even though the name isn't there, this is this is the only one this could be uh, in, John's, in, in John's understanding. And so uh, he knows the names of each of those churches and he knows where they are and, he, and how he mentions them are geographically, he's taking them through uh, the geographic journey that perhaps the letter, them, the letter itself made that journey too in that order. Um, 
Uh, okay, so in verse 11, let's just focus on two. Jesus wants his people then and now to note these things. They were to be written and preserved. Uh, Jesus entrusts his people with the truth about himself. So verses two or 12 to 16, we see what happens, what John sees. Of, and of course, he, the testimony that we have here suggests he is, that he was obedient. He wrote down what he saw. Um, and so he turns around and sees a glorious one whom we learn is Jesus. In verse 18, Jesus is the only one that John would have understood who had been dead and is behold alive forever and ever and holds the keys to death in Hades. Uh, so let's read 12 through 16 and then just think very briefly about uh, what each of these fascinating things mean. Um, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. I'm actually just going to go on and read the rest. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then I placed his right hand on me and and then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels. Uh, or messengers is another way you could translate that of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay. So in verses 12 to 16, then we see this glorious one. And how do we understand what John saw? Definitely. I suggest you symbolism is involved. Uh, the traits seem to be representing aspects of Jesus character. Again, I encourage you to think about where in the Old Testament have we heard about these things? Have we seen those things? Uh, and whether starkly literal or symbolic, what we can trust that what John saw and wrote is trustworthy. It's what Jesus wants us to know about himself. And yet that doesn't mean everything is plain. Isn't that interesting that we, even when Jesus explains some things, even though uh, in verse 20, he doesn't tell us maybe as much as we would want to know, um, he, he doesn't explain the characteristics of himself. Um, why doesn't Jesus tell us what each thing means? But, and again, I suggest to you, in addition to grabbing our hearts and our minds and helping us have a, uh, have a better eyes to see our own lives and the ways that, uh, we might've been lulled into ordinariness or fearing the wrong people or things, um, each feature that Jesus has that's described seems to send us back to God's word in the Old Testament and also uh, Jesus works in the new as a record in the New Testament. So what can we see about Jesus? Just briefly going down uh, in verse 13, we see he was like a son of man. And that's a Hebrew idiom, meaning literally son of Adam, uh, Adam. And so this is with Daniel 7 in our memory, this is probably not just any old human, but the one, the one that God has appointed to rule. Um, and we see his robe reaching down to his feet. That may denote uh, honor of royalty or a priesthood and anointing. Um, his white hair suggests great age and with great age wisdom. Like in Daniel 7, however, the one with white hair uh, was the ancient of days. And so now we have this, this blending where John has described something in Daniel seven, that is he's human and yet also divine. Uh, the, the mixture that we understand believers, Christians understand Jesus as being fully human and fully divine. Um, and his blazing eyes can penetrate 
and see all things. He sees and he knows. Um, His feet are bronze, tried by fires. They suggest perhaps absolute purity and, and supreme strength. And his voice of rushing waters may evoke images of judgment. Uh, think about the flood in Genesis 6 or 9. But it also may suggest the, the life-giving aspects of water, uh, living water, the, ru- the rivers that we will see at the end of Revelation flowing from uh, the New Jerusalem and the throne. Uh, his radiant face sed- expresses divine glory, just as Moses's face shone because he spent time with God on the mountain, Mount Sinai. That was reflective uh, because Moses had been with the Lord, his face shone. This one's face seems to shine of its own power. He is divine. And we see here, uh, str- startlingly, the The sword of his mouth, again, probably the word of God. It suggests power, discernment, judgment, truth. And notice that also the first thing that that John sees where this one is in verse 12 and and 13. Jesus is among the lampstands, which we see are the churches. He is present with his people, uh, currently unseen but real. He is actively protecting his churches, disciplining them and pursuing them. We're super forgetful and Jesus pursues us. Let's consider John's response uh, when in verse seven, he saw this, he was absolutely paralyzed. And that's a reaction not unlike other appearances in the Old Testament uh, of encounters with God, holy, the Holy God or his messengers. But notice our Lord who loves us that he would draw near to John and comfort his servant in three ways. First, he touches John with his right hand. Uh, That's his, in the ancient Near East, that's the hand of cleanliness, of purity, of strength, of power, and its personal connection. Second, he knows what John is experiencing, and he says, don't be afraid. That's a command, but it echoes what God often says to the faithful. And then, uh, why doesn't why doesn't John have to fear Jesus as the conquering priest and king and judge and prophet? Because of who Jesus is. And this is the third comfort. Jesus tells John who he is. Jesus experienced and overcame death for our sake, and he lives forever, and he intends life for all those who trust him. No one, nothing can snatch one of his own out of his hand. So, Our last principle I think that we can learn is Jesus wants his people to know him as he is. Jesus wants his people to know him as he is. Uh, If you belong to Jesus, Jesus wants you to know him. Uh, as he is, not a Jesus that you, um, that we would imagine him or want him to be like sometimes we do, uh, um, like say, like me, only better. Um, a made up Jesus is going to approve how we act and our decisions that we make, our priorities, who we are, but made of Jesus has no power. He cannot save you. The real Jesus knows that only he saves and he knows our wrong ideas about him and he corrects us based on what he reveals in the scripture. Jesus has authority to correct us and he loves us enough to do it. Um, What do you do when you encounter in the Bible something about Jesus you don't like or you don't understand? Um, Will you stop reading or dismiss it or pick another part of the scriptures to read Uh, or will you bring it to him? And ask him to correct you and to teach you his true character. Uh, Even when we know the stakes are high, we get sleepy, life gets ordinary, and we get lulled into uh, the wrong sense of priorities and decisions. Uh, Jesus isn't surprised. He pursues his followers. He crashes into our ordinary ways and jolts us uh, so that we might stay awake, so that we might live a blessed life, sharing in her suffering, being able to patiently endure and live on mission for him and persevere. Jesus wants us to live prepared for his certain coming. Revelation is part of Jesus' pursuit, that we might have a clear vision of who he is and what is truly important. Following Jesus now means sharing the hope, the same hope that John has. 
The return of Jesus is certain and sure, John holds out to us. It is a very big deal. And therefore, a book that talks about it, the Revelation, Revelation, is no ordinary book. This is no ordinary letter. Jesus wants you and me to be prepared for his certain coming. He knows what we don't. He's pursuing us, not because we deserve it, but because he is committed to the Father's plan of saving a people for himself. He loves us. He's faithful and true. We should trust him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for pursuing us and loving us and showing us who you are. Lord Jesus, uh, we ask that we would be slow to forget who you are and that we would be hungry for more of you and uh, that we would read your scriptures diligently uh, to better understand who you are and how you want us to live each individually on mission for you in the places where you have put us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week, friends.